good to be back. I love that video. We have eyes to see and ears to hear. So let's hear this morning some words of God. So uh, would you please join me in an attitude of prayer? Dear God, pour out your spirit upon this congregation, upon these people that I've grown up with and that I love, my home church. It's so good to say home church. You know, I was thinking about home a lot when I'm at college, and although it's so fun to go to the city and to experience new culture, it's always good to have a place to call home. And the fact that church can have home church is such a blessing to me and such a blessing to so many people. So help us this morning to open our doors, our minds, and our hearts to make this the home for so many. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. It is so good to be back. I just finished my first semester at Sarah Lawrence College. It's about 30 minutes outside of Manhattan, Sarah Lawrence College. And, um, and I'm so thankful to God for so many things. First of all, that the semester is over. <laughs> and mostly, that I'm able to receive such a unique education. You know, I thought that going to college meant that I would spend several hours studying at home, alone, reading and growing in my book smarts. For those of you that follow my social media, and according to weekly updates from my mom, that's a lot of you, <laughs> you know that my actual experience is quite different. But you see, pictures of studying just aren't as exciting as the pictures of my experiences in a whole new culture. Of course, I do spend several hours studying, but much to my surprise, most of my learning comes from interactions with my fellow students outside of the classrooms just in our conversations. These conversations are a little bit different than what I remember of my coffee hour conversations. When I was eating a cookie or three during a coffee hour or Bible study, surface talk seemed to be the only conversation, the only communication in which subjects like the upcoming craft fair or the band were discussed. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm sure the craft fair deserves conversation. I love crafts, but, and I'm sure the band really does sound great, but what levels of personal or relational growth do these surface topics reach? Some people may think, myself included some Sundays, that after an hour-long church service, the last thing I want to do is have a deep conversation with Sally's husband about his life which I know nothing about, although I shake his hand every Sunday morning. I'm guilty. Every Sunday morning, it looks like the same scene to me after service. It looks like what I imagine Moses' exodus from Egypt looks like. Except here, there's no sea to part. Even more challenging are the clumps of smiles connected to walls of hands, ready for routine shaking, and the same surface question, how are you? asked by someone, including myself, always expecting to hear great, or if you ask the pastor, you expect to hear blessed. This surface talk, the surface talk is employed only to ensure a quick exit without the burden of real talk about where I need support in my life, or how I could offer support to you in your life, or how our church could join together to support all of those in our community. Now, a few of you may be thinking, how could he talk like this about a coffee hour? <laughs> Some of you may be thinking, glad somebody finally said it. <laughs> and then there's probably maybe a few more that were already asleep until you heard the words coffee hour, woke up, expected the service to be over, and you're now disappointed. I'm sorry, but hey, welcome back. <laughs> if you were feeling uncomfortable, uneasy, or maybe even angry, that's good. I don't want to preach to a passive group. We are the children of God, and as such, we are called to a higher standard to act in the ways of Jesus, to speak God's love, and to engage in the trials of this world, to transform it into the image of our heavenly home. Our home church should be the mirror of our heavenly home. We're beyond the mundane casualness of typical church surface talk. We need real talk. You know, I, I was blessed to have the opportunity to hear pastors yesterday talk about their call to the Methodist Church and their, their call to different services in the church. And something that they said, we said, our church faces a lot of struggles right now. 
We, as the children of God, face a lot of struggles right now in this world. What do we do? How would you handle these problems? And overwhelmingly, the answer was, we have to come together. We don't need to blame or shame, but we need to identify an injustice. We need to have real talk. At Sarah Lawrence College, we have several talks throughout the semester, hosted by other students, upperclassmen. And these talks are called Real Talks. In the Real Talk space, we have a safe space where we are able to openly and honestly discuss injustices that are felt by individuals or groups on campus. And then we discuss, without blame or shame, we identify these injustices and talk together about how together we can be the change necessary to stop these injustices. Now, I don't know about you, but coming from our small town, it was easy for me to feel isolated from national or global events. Before going to college, I had never recognized racism because it hadn't affected me personally. And so, naively, I wondered if racism actually existed today, or if it was merely a product of the media, which was my only connection to the bigger world. Today, I now live, learn, and laugh with people from almost every continent. I hear languages from countries whose names I can't even pronounce, and my closest friends are from a diversity of races and religious backgrounds spanning from Buddhism to spiritual Egyptian plurality. Say that three times fast. <laughs> Unlike ever before in my life, I am part of a community which is rich because of its diversity of race, religion, ethnicity, sexuality, nationality, economic status, political affiliation, even dietary needs. <laughs> I have heard from my closest friends their testimonies of racist attacks and injustices committed against them. I now recognize racism because by affecting my friends, it affects me. I can feel my one friend's pain when she talks about discriminatory comments made toward her. And I can feel the other friend's pain, her fear of not being accepted by white Christian America because she is a Chinese Buddhist. I've had more talks about God and Jesus and faith with her than I have any other person. It is fascinating to me to see how the comfort level of a group can affect the depth of truth. I have found that there's a direct correlation between the level that a group has in trust with each other and the truth that people are willing to share. So when I was asked to preach on Human Relations Sunday, I really had to think, okay, going back to my home church with people that I love and I grew up with, but do I feel comfortable with this group to share the truths of my experiences and my interpretations? After much prayer, I realized that it was no coincidence that only after my college experience was I asked to preach specifically on Human Relations Sunday. And only after all of my experiences, and I can't wait to experience more. I also felt safe because I knew that right after this service I would be going back to New York City. <laughs> Not really, I love you guys. <laughs> but we need to move the church to a place where that wouldn't even have been a question in my mind a place where we can feel comfortable to honestly share how we are personally affected by acts of the church and injustices of our society. We don't need to blame or shame, we need to identify. The woman who only sees men preaching behind this pulpit needs to feel comfortable to voice her honest experience, identify that injustice and feel supported in making change. The 14-year-old girl of color needs to feel comfortable in her classroom, in her Sunday school, to ask why Jesus is depicted in our sanctuary as a well-groomed white man instead of representing the race in which he was actually born or the socioeconomic status which he actually held. The 19-year-old college student burdened with the debt of the education that our society tells us we need should feel comfortable attending dinners for those who can't provide food for their families. They shouldn't feel like they don't deserve the same aid. And so I've come to realize that we must become aware to become empathetic. It should not be the burden of the oppressed people to pursue God's vision of social and economic justice and equality. 
We need to become aware of our community, of the needs of all people, to understand and feel their pain. The ways of our loving and providing God must be sought by all followers for the safety and inclusion of all of God's children, our brothers and sisters in Christ. The church is a place where many people come together. And seeing here, many, many people. You know, we come together and we discuss biblical, social, and economic issues of this community. The church has always been intended to foster real talks but has been molded by church society itself, by me, by us, into a place where surface talk has become the sustenance of our conversations and real talk is rejected and feared. Now, as I was preparing for this service, it was during the season of Advent, and it was interesting to look at the Advent stories with this new lens of inclusion and equality. In Luke, specifically, chapter two, verses, 8 through 15, we hear the story of the shepherds, and this time it meant something totally different. Nearby, in the fields outside of Bethlehem, a group of shepherds were guarding their flocks. Suddenly, a messenger of the Lord stood in front of them, and the darkness was replaced by a glorious light, the shining light of God's glory. They were terrified. Don't be afraid, the messenger said. Listen. I bring good news and great joy, news that will affect all people everywhere. Today, in the city of David, a liberator has been born for you. He is the promised, anointed one, the supreme authority. You will know you have found him when you see a baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a feeding trough. At that moment, the first heavenly messenger was joined by thousands of other messengers. A vast heavenly choir praised God. The heavenly choir sang, to the highest heights of the universe, glory to God and on earth, peace among all people. As soon as the heavenly messengers disappeared into heaven, the shepherds were buzzing with conversation. They said, let's rush down to Bethlehem right now. Let's see what's happening. Let's experience what the Lord has told us about. Within the first sentence of this verse, an important description is made. In the fields outside of Bethlehem, a group of shepherds were guarding their flocks. A miracle, thousands of heavenly messengers appeared visibly on earth, but not where everyone would see them. Not in the place of cultural and social importance. The heavenly messengers appeared outside and made themselves visible to shepherds. Now, I don't have anything against shepherds, but if I'm watching a Rocky movie, and right as Rocky enters the ring, the scene cuts to a shoe shiner on the street corner, I'd be a little upset. Because that's not where I expect the most important action to occur. Everything else is seemingly unimportant to me. The shepherds were outside of the main focus, unnoticed and unimportant to the townspeople, and yet God valued them the most. God valued even those whom the people had rejected, and God made God's presence known to the shepherds out of all people. God loves even our outcasts. Who are the shepherds today? What people don't feel comfortable to enter into this building? Now, if you thought being a shepherd was bad, try being the son of God, but born in a filthy feeding trough and under Roman occupation. God could have birthed Jesus into a family of wealth, power, and prestige, and yet God chose Mary, an inexperienced teen virgin who would be rejected by her family and friends because of her bastard child who we call Savior. Did you know that one of the main reasons Jewish theologians reject Jesus as the messianic figure is because Jesus was prophesied, the Messiah was prophesied, to be a king? Someone with earthly influence that could raise the status of Israel. <coughs> Jesus was considered to be so socioeconomically low that he could never be royalty. The Israelites of that time expected an earthly king with great power, fame, and prestige, and yet God did the unexpected. And God chose the person of the lowest earthly standards to represent the highest heavenly hopes. Isaiah 53, 
verses 1 through 5 say, indeed, whoever would believe it? Who would possibly accept what we have been told? Who has witnessed the awesome power and plan of the eternal in action? Out of emptiness he came, like a tender shoot from rock-hard ground. He didn't look like anything or anyone of consequence. He had no physical beauty to attract our attention. So he was despised, forsaken by all of us. This man of suffering, he was grief's patient friend. As if he were a person to avoid, we looked the other way. He was despised, forsaken, and we took no notice of him. Yet it was our suffering he carried, our pain, our sick to the soulness. We just figured that God had rejected him, that God was the reason he was hurt so badly. But he was hurt because of us. Our wrongdoings crushed him. He endured the breaking that made us whole. The injuries he suffered became our healing. We figured that God had rejected him, that God was the reason he was hurt so badly. But he was hurt because of us. In today's world, it has become easy and common practice to ask God, why did you let this happen? Or why did you do this to these people? When the question we should be asking is how did I let this happen? Why didn't I speak up for the immigrants being deported and separated? Why haven't I welcomed the, the Syrian refugees who are homeless and dying? Why haven't I loved those whom God has always loved? Why haven't I paid attention to the shepherds? Now on the coffee hour committee, if George, who loves coffee hour, hadn't shown up to express his personal experiences, Taylor, who serves on the committee and is affected by George, understands George's experiences, has a responsibility to speak for George. We have a responsibility to speak for those who are forced silent by our society, for those who don't feel safe or comfortable to enter this building and share their personal experiences, the truths that they have. It should not be the burden of the affected to pursue God's vision of social and economic justice and equality. We figured that God was the reason he was hurt so badly. But he was hurt because of us. We can continue to be the oppressors or we can be allies of all of God's children without regard for socioeconomic status, race, sexuality, gender, citizenship, or any human discriminatory factor. We can focus on the one thing that God create us, created us as, God's children in the likeness and the image of God, you and me. The manifestation of God was born in a feeding trough. How can I look down upon the homeless? My savior was oppressed by systematic racism. How can I feel no need to be an ally for people of color whose voices are still choked silent in our society? How can I not love those who God has always loved? How can I only love the ones who look like me, or talk like me, or practice the same religion as me? He was hurt because of us. The immigrant families, the Syrian refugees, the people of color are hurting because of us. They're sisters and brothers in Christ who are given opportunities daily to live our faith, and yet we close the door to the neighbors that we were commanded to love. This morning I opened my phone and my Bible app usually doesn't send me a daily update. I turned off those notifications. My Bible app was draining my battery, but that's a good thing. <laughs> this morning though, it came up anyway. First John 4, verse 21. This commandment we have, get, we have received from him, him being Jesus. Those who claim to love God ought to love their brother and sister also. We have to let go of the image of perfection that we want to display on Sunday mornings and embrace the reality of our humanity, the fact that it was not only the white man created from this dirt, but all people of all races and religions. 
we are uncomfortable with these topics because we have become complacent, eagerly accepting the injustices of our society without questioning if they align with God's plan or just my agenda. To have real talk, we must lift our veils of perfection, take down our walls of insensitivity, abandon our attitude of complacency, and be real with each other, and be real with God. Psalm 27 says, my heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. Let's recognize God's call on our lives, a call to listen, not to the political speech or the hate speech of a dominant culture, but to discern God's way and to respond immediately in the direction of grace and love, unconditional love, unconditional. God's love is unaffected by who the world defines us as. God knows that we are all equally blessed that we are all equally valuable, equally talented, and we are all equally loved and equally created. Sisters and brothers in Christ, this is the intended effect, the purpose of this Human Relations Sunday celebrated in United Methodist churches around the world. The purpose is that one, we would create a safe space where we cannot blame or shame but identify. Meetings that happen in this church on weeknights or weekend to talk about the issues in our community and to become the change. And once we've created that space, the next purpose, our goal here in this community and in the world is to personally, you and me, become allies of all of God's children, my sisters and brothers, your sisters and brothers. We can no longer be complacent. We must be compassionate. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. What is God telling you today? And how will you respond? How can we be the change? And what change will you make happen in this community? Thank you.